Hey folks, welcome to Crypto Heartbeat. This is Matt and I am so excited. Today we have Daniel Miller. He is the candidate for the Lieutenant Governor position here in the great state of Texas. Daniel, welcome. Hey man, thanks for having me. You know, it is so great to, to be with you. I know we've spent some time, you know, previously and I know your history and just so excited for our audience to hear more about you and what your passion's been really almost your whole life. And, and then also get into kind of today's politics in Texas. And so I'd love for you to start with where it all started, Daniel. Oh, wow. That's a, uh, that's a, that's a bit of a long topic. Uh, you know, because there are a lot, and I, and I say that Matt, because there are a lot of people out there who, who, you know, their, their journey involves a very specific moment of clarity, right? The straw that broke the camel's back. Right. Uh, but for me, it was, it was very gradual and there were, it was a gradual evolution. You know, the, the household that I grew up in here in Texas, I was raised by my grandparents who were both depression era folks. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the things that they had, uh, that was always sort of a background, they were very blue collar folks, but th there was this background of civic engagement, right? And a lot of that involved sitting around the dinner table at night and, you know, complaining about what the federal government was doing on the news. Right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there was, there was a lot of that, you know, but my, my path was never to be involved in politics at all. Uh, I literally, people get stunned when I tell them this, but what I wanted to be was an astrophysicist. That was my, that was my dream. You know, I was pen pals with John Glenn because he was an wow. astronaut, you know, there was just a lot of that, that sort of trajectory. But, uh, when I was 18 years old, I ran for mayor of my hometown. Okay. A little town called White Oak, about a town of about 5,000 people. I lost, thankfully, because looking back on it, I wouldn't have voted for me either. Right. <laughs> I mean, he's an 18 year old kid. Uh, but, you know, it was, it was sort of that, that first thing on the path to being directly involved in, in wanting to see things changed. And, Probably because of the background, a lot of that was focused on federal issues. And there was one one moment of clarity for me that kind of summed up part of the challenge. You know, being a Cold War kid, uh, we were always taught about the the Soviet Union and communism and, you know, and and how horrible it was. But I went to a meeting. Uh, there were two brothers there. And after a little bit of banter, they handed me a copy of the U.S. Constitution, a copy of the Communist Manifesto and said, take these home and read them. And you tell us what you see in Washington, D.C. Wow. And of course, you know, I joke all the time, Matt, that as a Cold War kid, I was nervous to even have a copy of the Communist Manifesto in my possession. I, I right. literally hid it under the seat of the car on the <laughs> way home, uh, you know, kids. Right. So, uh, you know, bottom line is, is that, uh, you know, I read it and I could not I, I could not escape the conclusion that. Uh, the communist revolution had effectively taken place in, in Washington, D.C. And oh. you would see that because our rights, our fundamental rights were under assault all the time. So I came a very big constitutional rights activist uh, and, you know, just went out and just did what I did locally, handing out flyers, brochures, educating people, doing those things. But I got really frustrated, you know, a few years of that and understanding that even if it seemed like there was some progress made, there were 20 other things that would it dumped down on us hmm. that there was no way to combat. You know, it was just a, a never ending, uh, you know, it was, you could refer to it as Zeno's paradox where you never get there or, you know, a labor of Sisyphus where you're rolling the boulder uphill and it rolls down every time, you know, there's all kinds of metaphors for it. But the fact of the matter is that's what happened. And I was, I mean, I was discouraged. I was hmm. very frustrated, very discouraged. And then uh, in August of, of 1996, I was introduced to the idea that Texas could become a self-governing independent nation. And oddly enough, it harkened back to a book that I had read back a, a few years previous by John Nesbitt called Global Paradox. The book ostensibly was about the telecommunications revolution and its effect on the global economy. Uh, but, and of course, you know, being a tech guy, I love technology, uh, you know, it really resonated. But the other part of his paradox was that while the world's trends were pointing overwhelmingly toward, uh, toward economic interdependence, they were also pointing toward political independence. And he mm -hmm. cited a statistic that I talk about today uh, that at the end of World War II, there were roughly 54 fully sovereign recognized countries around the world. And by the time that book was written, there were 192. And, and so, you know, he, he showed that, uh, you know, he, he gave that example to really prove that 
this idea of self-determination, of autonomy, of self-government had really been going on as a key component of history in the latter half of the 20th century, but had been largely ignored in the context of the United States. So, you know, here, you know, having that, that information tucked away in the recesses of my mind and then being I introduced to the idea of Texas becoming a self-governing independent nation, August 24th, 1996, I crossed the proverbial line in the sand and made a pledge that I would work to see Texas as a free and independent self-governing nation state or until the grave digger patted me in the face with a shovel. E either way, which, whichever one came first. And, wow. and that's where I've been ever since. Wow. It gives me chills to hear you say it. You know, what the part about the grave digger, I didn't mean to. No, me. not that part. The part about <laughs> Texas being an independent nation. You know, we have a lot of folks in our in our community that are not from the United States. And if you don't mind, give us a little history, because you said, uh, you know, Texas becoming an independent nation. And that would be once again. So you don't mind sharing a little bit of Texas history with these folks to realize really where Texas come, comes from and why this culture here is so strong. Sure. You know, and, and uh, I'll, I'll try to encapsulate as best as possible, because honestly, Matt, I could really go in the weeds by Texas. Yeah, I know you can. <laughs> uh, I love it. Uh, but, you know, uh, starting about 1835 uh, is, is where we'll start. Prior to 1835, Mexico had encouraged colonists to come in from the United States uh, and, and other countries to, to colonize, to carve a, a, an empire out of a wilderness, to settle the land because they needed to lay claim to it. And so Mexico encouraged uh, immigration and settlement in Texas. And there at the time, they lived under a constitutional republic. It was a federative constitutional republic, not unlike the United States, with guaranteed rights. And, and what you found was is that leading into the 1830s and you know, moving beyond that, sort of into that 1834, 1835, as you began to see the government. Uh, really clamped down on the colonists. They, you know, they obviously forcibly uh, chose them to forcibly convert to Catholicism, uh, which most gladly did. Uh, but there were a lot of other key issues where, you know, when it came to, uh, you know, ownership of firearms. I mean, there, were, there was a, just a ton of things that as being part of the United States, these colonists were used to, they, they had a certain perspective on how inviolable their rights were. And all of that culminated in uh, effectively the Santa Ana, the dictator, uh, well, Santa Ana, the, the military general conspiring with the church to overthrow the Constitution of 1824 and really began to try to rein in Texas. And Texas at the time was not its own separate state within the Mexican Federation. It's actually part of a super state uh, with Coahuila. Okay. And so the, the Mexican government effectively overthrew the Constitution, betrayed the agreement that those people had immigrated there under. And next thing you know, they begin to send in troops to confiscate firearms, uh, most notably happened in uh, October 2nd, 1835, where they sent Mexican dragoons in to capture a cannon to which the settlers hoisted a white flag emblazoned with a cannon and the words come and take it. Nice. So, you know, that was, that was really a, a, a launching point for what became the Texas revolution. Uh, you know, we, that, that led right into the battle of the Alamo uh, where the Alamo fell after a 13 day siege. Uh, but prior to the fall of the Alamo on March 2nd, you had a convention of delegates gather at Washington on the Brazos and issue out a formal declaration of independence. Uh, that independence was finally won by uh, Sam Houston and the Texian Army at the Battle of San Jacinto on April 21st, 1836. Uh, and then Texas became a self-governing independent nation, uh, under which uh, it, it was that way for about nine years. Uh, and then through several negotiations and a little bit of political chicanery on the Washington side, uh, Texas became a state of the union. They agreed to join the union. Uh, the union agreed to have them. And uh, that's where it sits. And Texas has has been a state uh, within the confines of that union. And and honestly, Matt, part of the the big challenge that so many Texan advocates have right now is that the understanding that Texas had when it joined the union is no longer the reality of the relationship between Texas and the federal system. Right. Right. Well, one of the things you've you've often said that I've heard you talk about is how unique the Texas Constitution is. And it's different than other state constitutions, primarily because of its history. Do you mind kind of sharing that, those key points? Yeah, I mean, there was obviously an evolution. Uh, you know, Texas had a Republic of Texas Constitution in 1836. 
Uh, they drafted a new state constitution uh, in 1845. Then there were several iterations of the constitution uh, around the time of the Civil War and post-Civil War. But ultimately, where it landed was the Constitution of 1876, which is the Constitution that we have right now. And, and it did some really key things uh, that are related to, to Texas history. Number one is it jammed a Bill of Rights in Article One. Um, you know, these were not afterthoughts. This was right in Article One. Literally, the first words of the Texas Constitution are Texas is a free and independent state. So, uh, you know, that, that, that guarantee that, that expression, uh, you could call it aspirational if you want to, or yeah. just a statement of fact, uh, is really coupled with article one, section two, which is an explicit reservation of the right to abolish, re uh, reform, uh, abolish or abolish our government in any such manner as we may think expedient, reserving that right is an inalienable right to the people of Texas. So, you know, it is, it is a pure expression. The beautiful part about that section is that you find some form of that in every governing document in Texas, all the way back to the Republic Constitution of 1836, uh -huh. basically reminding government and anyone who would ever question it that ultimately the people decide by whom and how we are governed. Yeah. Well, and you you talked uh, you talk about this idea that all political power is where. Oh yeah, I, I know, right? I do that. But you would be surprised, Matt. Yeah. You know, I talk about that. And, and just to give some context for, for people who don't know the inside joke here that Matt hears me say this all the time. Article one, section two of the Texas Constitution says this. It says that all political powers inherent in the people and all free governments are founded on their authority and instituted for their benefit. The people of Texas stand pledged to the preservation of a Republican form of government and subject to this limitation only. They have at all times the inalienable right to alter, reform, or abolish their government in such manner as they may think expedient. Okay. It, it is that is about as Jeffersonian as it gets, but it, it really, Matt, it, it echoes this, this fundamental principle that has permeated the world. I mean, at that time, it was fairly unique to Texas. Uh, and and really being in a governing document like that, I think unique in the world, because even the United States constitution, not even in the bill of rights there, did it have that explicit declaration. So it, it was very unique in that regard, but you see this recognition of the right of self-determination existing and spreading throughout history from 1836, all the way to today around the world is a recognized right of the people to determine how and by whom they are governed. So, uh, you know, it, it is to me, as I say, probably one of the most beautiful and purest uh, expressions of the right of self-determination in a governing document that exists. Wow. Wow. That's fantastic. And, you know, it's um, most of the folks watching this probably don't know, but you have written the quintessential book on this topic, which is called Texit. And that sounds familiar to a lot of our friends in the UK because it sounds like Brexit. Can you describe, you know, that concept of Texit and and the book that you've written? Yeah, and and let me say this: we were using the term Texit uh, before the term Brexit was really being ban bannered okay. around. Well, because where where we got it, what we first heard the, the first time we heard any sort of iteration of that was when uh, during the Greek Euro crisis, right pre Brexit, when you know there was a big big discussion about the fact that there was a Greek monetary crisis, yeah. uh, specifically with the Euro. And, and there was some, di di dis I guess some, some real discussion about whether or not Greece was going to pull out of the Euro and go back to the drachma. And, and you had these economists coin the term Grexit wow. uh, for a Greek exit from the Euro. And we, we, so the first time we saw that, we're like, wait a minute, we literally have an X in our name. This That's right. Way better for us than it does for them. That's right. So that we started using it, but you know, everybody knows it for Brexit, but, but essentially what it boils down to is Texas is about uh, what exactly what it says on the 10, which is a, a Texas exit or withdrawal from the union. Yeah. Well, you know, what's fascinating to me about this concept of self-determination and certainly the culture of Texas, but people all across the world, you know, um, I interact with folks now from literally almost every country. And it seems like because of COVID and lockdowns and mandates that we have really this common experience. And I would say everyone that I'm talking to is really seeing authoritarianism on the rise. And it's not just a 
U.S. thing. It's it's yeah. more than that. And I feel like um, there's a lot of concern that who's going to stand up? Who's going to stand up for us? And one of the things I see in this Texas movement that you're leading and that you're you've you spent your almost your entire life working on is that it seems like the timing is now. Well, it is. Look, you know, here, here's here's the thing. And if we want to weave the the COVID into it, we can't. But, you know, I think rather than specifically that, I think we can talk about authoritarian on the rise. But I refer to it as the last gasp of globalism. You know, okay. people, you know, and when I talk about globalism, I'm not talking about, you know, free trade or fair trade. I'm talking about this ideology of globalism, which is indeed a, its own ideology that is not exactly what it says, right? There, there are a lot of layers to globalism, but one, one of the things about globalism is <clears throat> they did, you know, globalists detest the concept of a nation state because it is a, a resistance to their global dream of central planning and global government. And so, you know, you, you look at it and, and we are effectively in this pitched battle. If you go look at the last 70 years, 75, 80 years of history, it has been this pitched battle between the very fundamental idea of a nation state and, and these globalist central planners. Right. And, and when you look at history through that lens, <clears throat> you, you see over the span of time that globalism has, has really been back on its heels, right? I mean, they have done this central planning. They have tried to implement these plans. But if the nation state is anathema to globalism, then you can't you can't say that globalism is winning if there has been a a veritable explosion of nation states and, right. and this idea of nation states uh, being self governing entities outside of this global regime. Uh, you you can't say that globalism is winning. And so you, this recent spike in authoritarianism they they have gone from this strategy of incrementalism right from a generational fight to the fact that, okay, look, we, we have to cement our stranglehold now or, or they risk losing it. Uh, and, and look, I, I make no bones about it. I'm not, not saying that COVID is, is some sort of, you know, globalist conspiracy, but they never let a crisis go to waste. Right. And, and, I, and I will say this, I, the growth of independence movements in the United States, the discontent of the States with, with the federal government, and you couple that with, the growth of Euroscepticism in the EU, I think, has probably pushed them to to want to accelerate their program, right? Uh, because there's there is no doubt that these supranational unions are are spinning apart. They're anachronistic, right? Well, when you look at um, the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab and this whole Great Reset, and I mean, it is it is bone chilling to hear the tenets of that ideology. And I think that, um, you know, people, you know, they, they're not letting this go to waste, certainly. But also, I think that there are um, freedom loving, independent people who are seeing that for what it is. Do you do you agree or do you think people are being fooled? No, I, I think they are. I mean, you know, we we keep seeing, uh, you know, people talk about what's happening in Australia. And I believe that <sighs> what's happening in Australia and, and frankly, in Canada right now, starting to ramp up in Canada are, are petri dish you know, petri dish experiments for how this sort of authoritarian authoritarianism can play out in Western constitutional republics and democracies, right? Um, you know, that that has been the best. You, you have countries around the world that are absolutely comfortable with authoritarianism, right. but you have these countries like the UK, like, uh, you know, the, the states of the United States or Australia or Canada that have a history that, that says, look, we believe in, in the fundamental rights of the individual and, and to, to varying degrees. I mean, you know, you can have some various policy discussions about that, but at a very fundamental level, everyone in these Western governments understands that this is problematic, these actions that are being taken by government. And, and I think that they just saw it as a, as a tremendous opportunity. And it's one of the reasons we should all be paying very close attention to what's happening in Australia and Canada, because what's happening there today is, is something that could very well happen here tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm an optimistic person by nature. And when I read your book, I was, um, I was encouraged and I would say there's a lot of things about the state of Texas, um, that make it an ideal candidate for, I mean, so many reasons. And I'd love to share with folks, 
One of the big questions people ask, and I think this is probably the um, the moderate and guardians in the world, my wife being one of them, who um, thinks that independence movement means everybody picks up a gun and shoots each other. Will you dispel that myth? Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll do my best to dispel the myth. That is that is really uh, I, I I talk about this in the book, uh, which by the way is called Texas: Why and How Texas Will Leave the Union. Uh, but I talk about it because we have a very recent uh, history with seeing that type of, of mentality play out. And, and I talk about it in a chapter called Project Fear. Uh, that, that title, the title of that chapter came from <clears throat> what happened during the Scottish independence referendum back in 2014, where the, the arguments against independence, rather than centering on some of the specifics of policy, some of the you know potential challenges logistically really began to center around this this fear mongering strategy where it's you know it was painting these doomsday scenarios, yeah. and and it became called Project Fear. Uh, that's what they that's that's what they called it uh, because it started happening in the newspapers and TV and and Project Fear ultimately failed because that's not what scuttled the Scottish independence referendum. That's a, that's a whole other topic. Right. Uh, but they ran the same play for Brexit where, you know, they, they, they projected this, these, uh, these apocalyptic scenarios uh, of things that would happen if the people voted to withdraw from the European union. And in doing so, what they did was they, they, they took rational thinking people who said, wait a minute, I'm not going to be scared by your apocalypse scenarios uh, and, and really turn them into, into pro into Brexiteers. And that's, that's what we see here. So the idea, if you look at the last say 100 years of, of independence, what you find is the, the norm is not an exit based on, violence or war. You see exits as orderly things that take place, orderly withdrawals. Typically, uh, and the majority of them will have some type of vote of the people okay. where the people express their political will. And then on the other side of that expression of political will comes a, a process that is constitutional, that's statutory, that deals with international covenants and agreements. And then finally, negotiation with the body that you're going to withdraw from. And it no point in there is let's pick up a gun and go raise right, a little right. hell. That that's just not that's, part of the strategy. That's huge. And I think that's really important for people to understand because this idea that you can in a peaceful way negotiate withdrawal because you have the right to, number one. But I also want to make the case for um this uh, this process because one of the things that that I've heard you're leading up to is this idea of um You've seen a lot of polling over the years, and you've seen uh, a lot of indications that it's not just one political party. It's the people of Texas, if given the chance to vote, um, very well could choose to not continue to be in the union. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Look, our, our organization, the Texas Nationalist Movement, uh, outside of the two major political parties, is the largest political advocacy organization in Texas. Okay. That ought to tell you something as an organization that is explicitly advocating for the political, cultural and economic independence of Texas is is the largest political advocacy organization outside the two mainstream political parties really should say it all. But for us, this is something that we already knew. Um, you know, we when we founded the TNM back in 2005. Uh, the issue of, of independence was polling in single digits. Now, I, I joke all the time and say that even in at polling in single digits, we always polled higher than the approval rating of the United States Congress, which typically has an approval rating somewhere above or below leprosy. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, just depending on, I guess, who's in power there. But the, the bottom line is, is that when we began active advocacy on the ground, which involved connecting with Texas voters, that's not what we were seeing. We weren't seeing single digits. We were seeing significantly more than that. Well, you fast forward to, to 2009 and you have this poll that came out in uh, from Research 2000 uh, and they asked the question, do you think Texas would be better off as an independent nation? Right. So not a question of political will, but just right. sort of let's let's blue sky this thing and see what you think. And the, the results were shocking to them. 
uh, because they had just shy under 50% Republicans. They had 45% of independents wow. and they had 15% of Democrats. Hmm. And you got to remember that was a year into Barack Obama's first term. Wow. And so you had one out of six Democrats here in Texas and independents, which had to put, you know, were the kind of voters that put Obama in office were ready for Texas to, to say, you know, look, we would be better off. But then you fast forward 2014, uh, around the time of the Scottish independence referendum. It seems like every time someone else has a referendum, we get polled, which, yeah. you know, whatever. Sure. Uh, but uh, right around that time, there was the Reuters Ipsos poll that came out, and they asked the flat question, do you think Texas should withdraw from the union to become an independent nation? And the, the results were earth shattering, right? I mean, they were, they were bombshell. Uh, you had 54% of Republicans. You had half of independent voters and 35% of Democrats. And that's two years, not even quite two years into Barack Obama's second term. So, you know, here, here we are where you've got these growing numbers that went from, yeah, I think it'd be better. You know, I, I think it would be better off as an independent nation to, yeah, let's just pull up stakes. Let's just go make this thing happen. And then, you know, there's been subsequent polling, you know, and most of the polling methodologies take slices and dices, but you find you know, this major poll, I think it was Victory Insights that did one that was like two thirds of Southern Republicans want their state to leave. Here's a spoiler alert that was weighted heavily because of Texans just right. saying, um, you know, and then so so you you get these these polling numbers. But but the bottom line is this, Matt, we would not be pushing so hard for a referendum if we thought that there was a snowball's chance in hell we would lose. Right. Right. And, and here's what it boils down to. Beyond the polling. We know that when it comes time to make the case for Texas, which has to happen, obviously, when there, there's a vote, there will be a time for everyone to weigh out the pros and cons and have the debate. But when that happens, we know that we can make the case for independence, and they can't. They want to run Project Fear, yep. and we've got the facts. And, and it all boils down to this one single question, and it's this. When we ask the people of Texas, if Texas right now was a free, independent, self-governing nation among nations, we had everything that independent nations had, right? We had our own control of our own borders and immigration. We had control of our own monetary policy, our own economy and trade, trade agreements. We had our own military. We had our own passports and embassies. We even had our own Olympic team, right? We were self-governing in every way. And instead of talking about Texas, the question is, do you want to join the union? Mm -hmm. Knowing everything you know about the federal government and the federal system right now, today, would you vote to join the union? And we can't find people that say yes. They, they, mm -hmm. they, they won't say yes. And so the, the natural follow-up is, well, if you wouldn't vote to join, why in the world would you ever vote to stay? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. You know, one of the things I've had discussions with people on both sides of this, this discussion and, and heard a lot of different points. And one of the things that really strikes me, and I think what is, um, you know, you talked about having the Communist Manifesto and reading both the Constitution and that. And there's something that's happened in me pretty recently where I look at the state of affairs right now and I look at how much I love the beauty of what the founding fathers had done in the United States. And there's there's a part of me that says the only way we're going to be able to preserve that which we know is right, meaning preserving what is great about America, is actually by strengthening the state of Texas and potentially leaving the union. And to me, it's almost more patriotic to do that because you're standing up for the principles that actually were at the core of, of the founding of America. Do you see it that way? Yeah. Look, you, you have to define what America is yeah. and yeah. you know, there, and that's, that really is the problem is that there are too many people who conflate the United States of America as a political and economic construct with America, the principles that, you know, and, and the, the idealism that exists with it, uh, they conflate the two. And, and that really is a, a ploy on the part of the people who worship the federal government. Uh -huh. They want you to conflate the two. Uh, they want, they want you to think flag mom and apple pie, uh, when the federal government does something you don't like, right. They want to, they want to appeal to that sense. And, and I'll tell you, Matt, I go back to a speech that Margaret Thatcher gave back, I guess it was it was in the 80s when she was still prime minister, and it's referred to as the Bruges speech, hmm. uh, where it really was the speech that sort of kicked off 
modern Euroscepticism related to the, the, at that time, the common market, which eventually became the EU, but that speech really kind of launched it. And, and one of the things that, that she talked about in that speech is that even if the UK did not become part of, of the Euro, you know, if, if it didn't for, follow that path of tighter integration, they would still be European. They would be European by virtue of a common set of principles, by history and geography, they would always be good partners, great neighbors, the best of friends. But just because of that did not mean that they absolutely all had to bow a knee to some central institution. Wow. And, and that was, you know, when you, when you look at it that way, it really, it really, I think, defines the debate that we have here right now over what is America, you know, because we, we cannot conflate the two. If we look at it from a, a purely analytical standpoint, the United States of America is is a federative, uh, you know, republic. It's a federative union that is at its core, according to the governing document, it is a mutual defense pact. It is an economic treaty, right? I yep. mean, it is a, a free trade agreement. It's a postal union, and it's a <laughs> right. currency union. I mean, that's that's literally what it is. And everything in the Constitution is is sur surrounding the implementation of that aspect of the union. And so anything outside of those confines is not the United States of America. And so when you look at it that way, you have to ask yourself, OK, so if I'm a believer in the principles under which the union was created to preserve, if that political and economic and military union no longer serve or protect those principles, should we still be a part of that union? Or is the best way to uphold those principles to do so outside of that framework? Wow. Wow. That, that's, I'm so glad that you shared that because I think that that's really important for people to understand. You know, it's, um, it's often conflated. Well, let me ask you some specifics about Texas. I know there's some pretty interesting facts about Texas that a lot of people don't know. So help me understand, if Texas was an independent nation, tell me some of the facts about this independent nation and what it would be, uh, what it would be. Because my understanding is it's got a pretty good size economy compared to other, other states. Yeah, globally, um, you know, as of the last quarter, we're the ninth largest economy in the world. Uh, but you know, that, that here's, here's, what's great about that. Um, you know, that is in spite of all of the problems that we have yeah. within the United States, right? The, the monetary policy and inflation, uh, or the federal regulatory regime, right? So we're, we're able to be the ninth largest economy in the world, even under those restrictions, but post Texas, when those things are no longer an issue. Right. Well, all of a sudden now you're looking at Texas becoming a much larger economy globally. And I'll, I'll give you some good examples. Currently, Texas overpays anywhere from about 103 to $160 billion annually into the federal system. Think about the economic impact of having that revenue back in Texas circulating through the economy. And then, boom, there's an immediate jump. Right. You know, you take this study that came from, there was actually two separate studies, one, one from George Mason University that tracked the effect of federal regulatory accumulation on uh, the economy of the various states. Now, the, what they essentially said was the federal government has never met a regulation they don't like. And so the, the tendency is, is that they layer them one on top of the other. And so what they found in the study was on average, it cr created a 2% compression of GDP annually. Hmm. And so when you look at that from 1949, which was the year of the, the growth, the beginning of the, the growth of the regulatory super state, you look at that from 1949, what they, the conclusion that they came to was, is that when the study was released a few years ago, the median household income was about $54,000 annually. And in the absence of that federal regulatory accumulation, the median household income would have been $330,000 annually. So immediately when Texas becomes an independent nation, you have the ability to shuck off this federal regulatory super state wow. and unleash business and unleash the entrepreneurial spirit and unleash investments 
to the tune of about a 600% pay increase for each household. Wow. Well, think about what the effect that is on the economy. So now we're not looking at being the ninth largest economy in the world. We're looking at perhaps being the fourth, fifth, or sixth largest economy in the world. And, and by restoring that bridge, right, the, the traditional bridge from poverty to prosperity is entrepreneurship. Sure. Those regulations, not only do they disproportionately affect the working poor and, and those below the poverty level, but it also creates a very high barrier to entrepreneurship and investment. Yeah. You get rid of those, that bridge is built, and all of a sudden now, now you have this renaissance, uh, this explosion of entrepreneurship and investment wow. in Texas that yeah. cannot exist under the federal system. Well, and you know what's interesting is, you know, I'm in the in the crypto space and there's so much wealth and abundance that's being created. And you think of having Texas as an independent nation being friendly to crypto would be a, a boon for, for Texas as well, not in all the things that you've just mentioned. So it, that's amazing. Now, tell me about... Well, Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, look, for, from a, a crypto perspective, I mean, that that's why anyone who is who is serious or or even just an enthusiast about cryptocurrency should should be extremely hostile to any attempts by the federal government or frankly, any state government on the regulation of cryptocurrency, because right. that, you know, the moment that they put their hands on it, yeah. uh, they they destroy the ability for us to innovate, they destroy the ability for us to invest and become entrepreneurs. Wow, wow. So let's let's kind of go down the list here. Uh, so we got top 10 economy. Um, you know, folks don't realize uh, seaports and resources. Can you go through that list? I know you've got this great list in your, in your book of all the things that make Texas so unique. Do you mind kind of ticking those off for us? Yeah, I mean, look, we have the the number one. We have the number one port for imports and exports uh, right here in Texas. Texas is the number one state for manufactured exports out of all the states of the United States. Uh, we're the number one energy producer, both by by production and refining. Uh, I mean, you, the the list goes on and on. I mean, with a massively educated workforce, a massive land mass. I mean, we're tops in agriculture. Uh, we are the brand new Silicon Valley. Um, you know, we we are reclaiming our title as the Silicon Prairie with the I-35 corridor, uh, where there are more tech startups and tech companies uh, than there have ever been. And so technology, innovation, energy, agriculture, trade, manufacture, uh, you know, across all measures, Texas is poised to become a global dominant economic powerhouse. Well, and I've heard recently too, that they've discovered rare earth uh, metals in Texas as well. I mean, as a whole new, you know, everyone thinks of oil in Texas, but they don't realize China basically owns all the rare earth metals that go into battery production. And my understanding is that Texas may find itself in a really interesting position from that perspective as well. Yeah. The, the beautiful part about it is, you know, much like China has, has not only the rare earth minerals that they mine within their own borders, uh, you know, but they have all the manufacturing plants for the technology and the chips. Uh, Texas is poised to do that. I mean, with this with this find of rare earth minerals uh, that could rival China, uh, all of a sudden now you you look at all of this chip manufacturing that's happening on the I thirty five corridor, and now we don't have to outsource. You know, we can mine, refine, and manufacture right here in Texas. So one of the things I, I think is um, a lot of people. Uh, get really discouraged, whatever the country they're in. You mentioned Australia and, you know, I hear from those folks a lot. There's something about what you're saying. I feel like that is an inspiration because it's, um, you know, Brexit was different in my mind, as far as how things were negotiated. There's something about um, freedom and sovereignty and independence that Texas has always been a part of. And it, it seems like there's also this opportunity for really for real leadership in the world when it comes to standing up for indiv individual liberty. Can you speak to that? Because I almost feel like people are looking to you and looking to Texas to lead. Uh, we get emails uh, every day, phone calls from people in other states uh, and and other countries uh, that are looking at that that are either looking to relocate here or looking for some type of hope, right? And one of the mantras that you hear from the anti-Texas politicians here, uh, our governor, Greg Abbott, is, is notorious for this line, and, and so is my opponent in the lieutenant governor's race, Dan Patrick. They're notorious. By the way, let me pause and just, again, indicate 
that the fact that the sitting governor and the sitting lieutenant governor are having to publicly comment on Texas yes. ought, to, uh, ought to give people some, some indication of where this is, how it has entered into mainstream politics. But that was an aside. Okay. Right. So, uh, but, but the phrase that they love to use is, you know, I, I believe that Texas should lead and not leave. But what if leaving is the leadership example? Yep. You know, what, what if embracing your right of self-government is the example that we should be setting as opposed to engaging in utter futility and reforming a federal system that is immune to reform, right? That's just right. insanity. But what if that leadership example is, is leaving, withdrawing from the union, reclaiming our rights, reclaiming our right of self-government, reasserting our status as an independent nation, and then creating an example for anyone else to follow. Right. You know, that, that, is, that is ultimately it. And if you think about it from the standpoint of, of what the United States became immediately after its founding, you know, it became a beacon to the rest of the world of what a free people could do when left to their freedom. Yeah. Right. When, when the government didn't interfere, well, guess what? The United States is still an example for a lot of people, but let's be honest. A lot of those people are coming from countries that are far better off or far worse off than the United States. Right. But, but what if there was another example? What if there was another counterpoint that said that, you know, central planning, this European path that the United States is on is really not the future. The future is what we have seen over the last 80 years, self-governing, independent nation states that, that focus on their priorities, that don't take a knee to any external source, that don't have uh, anyone else to answer for for their governance. And then let that, those people, so inspired by that independence, uh, create an example for the rest of the world to follow to say, yeah. you know what, we can do that too. Wow. And you know what, it's, um, it's very empowering and very exciting, the implications of it. Um, there are obviously some folks who get nervous, right? They're, they're cautious, moderate people who are thinking about, well, what about the, the military? I'm here in central Texas and we've got one of the largest military bases in uh, the uh, Western hemisphere. Um, obviously there's uh, all sorts of thoughts about, you know, when, when the people do um, have this referendum and they choose, there's a time period where there's negotiations and all that. So can you tell us about that? Because I think a lot of people think it's, you know, they read in the history books about throwing tea in the harbor. And this is, this is different in the sense that it is a process. Yeah. And, and frankly, the, the, you know, the, the throwing the tea in the harbor, the unilateral declaration of independence is, is sort of a, it's not a normal thing over the last 70 years. It's just not, uh, it, it has happened. There was an example, uh, you know, in the late 20th century Kosovo, uh, you know, there was a, a massive debate over Kosovo's unilateral declaration of independence and, and look, it's a tool, right? There, there is a tool and there is a time for that, but the time for that, uh, is, is when all other measures have failed. Right. Right. Uh, you look, we go back to the example in history of the Republic of Texas, uh, you know, before there was a declaration of independence on March 2nd, 1836, there were multiple attempts to remedy the situation and secure the rights of the people of Texas under the existing system. So, what, but what we have is we have these, these in more recent years as this idea of the nation state, these, these relationships have, have evolved and people have become more comfortable with them. Uh, you have these, these referenda, right? For us in Texas, having a referenda on the, a referendum on the issue is non-negotiable. Article one, section two that I quoted earlier puts the power in the hands of the people. So the people have to ultimately be the ones who make the decision of political will as far as independence or staying. Okay. But once that happens, uh, there is again this mistaken idea that okay, well, next day it's all anarchy, right? Right, right, right? That you have to have everything done before you even have the vote, and it's like that's not how it works at all, right? You you have an expression of political will, and then once that expression of political will happens, then you begin to use the institutions that you already have to make good to implement the will of the of the people, and, and so what that means is day one. 
after the independence vote, there will probably be a lot of Texans nursing some hangovers, probably a lot of fireworks, a lot of parades. But literally, from the standpoint of governance, nothing changes until our government here in Texas begins the process of implementing the results of that vote. Yeah. You know, it's it's very similar to what happened in the UK with the Brexit vote. They had some hoops that they had to jump through, like, you know, invocation of Article 50. You know, there was a set process. We don't have that. So that that gives us actually a lot more latitude in how fast or slow the process is. Right. And and so and I highlighted these four things, but there are four things that have to take place after the referendum okay. to implement the, the political will. Right. And that is there are constitutional changes, right? We have to make any kind of tweaks or changes to our constitution. We don't have to draft a new one. We just have to go through the constitutional amendment process to the existing constitution and and do that. And that actually can be done in in one batch. We actually, there was a uh, a, 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 a sort of a similar situation back in the 1960s with what was called the Deadwood Amendments where they did a constitutional overhaul to remove anachronistic language, things related to Spanish land law. Uh, and they did that in, in one amendment, right? So we could do that in one fell swoop, but we have to draft it. So constitutional issues, and, and they're, they're very small. Expansion of certain agencies, um, you know, for example, we don't have anything that deals specifically with foreign affairs right now. That position would typically in a U.S. and the U.S. type system would be Secretary of State. So we would have to amend the Constitution if that's the direction we wanted to go. We'd have to amend the Constitution to give that power and authority to the Office of the Secretary of State. So things like that, changing the name from State of Texas to Republic of Texas, changing governor to president, lieutenant governor, vice president, you know, those sorts of things. So beyond the constitutional issues, you have some statutory issues, and those really fall into into two categories. Number one. Uh, deals with any agencies that are authorized under statute that we will want to assume functions or duties of those federal agencies that will no longer be here. Those will have to be expanded statutorily. And then the uh, the second component to that specifically uh, deals with gaps in state law where there is actually the, the state over time has allowed federal law via preemption to mm-hmm. fill in gaps, okay. right? So they don't, so we don't have corresponding laws. So there may be some of that that we want to do. Okay. So then the third thing is international covenants, treaties, and agreements. Uh, there are certain quite, you know, kind of formalities that you want to sign on to. There's, you know, there's an international convention dealing with things like air traffic, right? And, and things of that nature. Um, you know, there are some that deal specifically with uh, fishing waters, th- things that the United States has signed on to. They're very mundane, but they're also necessary. Right. So there are those international covenants, treaties and agreements, uh, including the potential for us to, at that point of the process, begin to go out and negotiate our own trade deals. So, you know, when we had NAFTA's replacement, the USMCA um, you know, we, there, we would no longer be a party to that at the moment that we formally withdrew from it. So we would probably want to go through and negotiate our own trade agreements with other countries. Uh, now, good news is Texas has already laid a lot of that groundwork, right? Uh, Texas has a very active international economic engagement program. Okay. So the final thing, and this is the, the first time the federal government ever enters into the equation. It is the negotiated issues. Right. So there are a certain number of issues between the United States and Texas that will have to be negotiated across the table. Things like what about the the share of Texas funds out of the uh, Medicare trust fund? Mm -hmm. Uh, What about, uh, you know, how are we going to handle what we have to hammer out a social social security totalization agreement so people don't lose work credits for the social security pension plans uh, or any federal pension plans Uh, negotiation for uh, whatever our portion of the federal debt will be. So there, there are certain negotiated issues like federal installations uh, federal equipment here. I mean, there's there's a ton of those things that are going to have to be addressed, but not a lot. You know, there's not that they are large issues, but there's not a a large number of them that we have to negotiate out. And the negotiations are are such that we have plenty of history to look back on to see how these issues were handled with other countries that withdrew withdrew from larger unions. 
You know, this has been and so enlightening. You know, I've read your book, but to have you share it in this format, to, to understand how reasonable it is, um, obviously those that oppose it would want to stir up fear. But when you describe it that way and you talk about this is not a new concept and folks have done it over the last 50 years in, you know, to the tune of what, at least 100 uh, sovereign nations or nation states or more. And so it's pretty... Um, It's really helpful, I think, for people to realize that this effort that you're leading, what you've written the book about is not some militia project, but this is actually helping people become, uh, you know, self-determination, sovereignty, independence, um, and doing it what I would consider to be the right way. Would you agree? Well, look, if, I mean, why would I write a book about doing it the wrong way? There you go. <laughs> you there you know? go. No, you're right. <laughs> but, you know, look, here's what it boils down to. Th- this has always been, this issue has always been couched as, as unreasonable. And, and look, I've been at this for 25 years. Uh, it, it has been a, a beyond political activism. It has been about just getting as deep into this issue as one possibly can, you know, down to, um, researching internationally what ballot language should look like. I mean, you know, what, what the referendum should ask. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and people would be surprised at the amount of academic research that has been done around the, the concept of the nation state uh, and specifically the, the referendum question. But it's, it's making sure that as an organization and, and frankly, Matt, as an individual, that, that we're going about this the right way that we're saying things that are true, that are reasonable, that are rational and and not pie in the sky. You know, one of the things about the book uh, is you'll notice that I don't talk about a lot of post Texas policy, right? Because ultimately it's, it's not up to me to say, this is what Texas will absolutely look like. It's actually up to us, right? right? Because for the first time, the people will have an opportunity to really have a say in their government and how they're governed. I mean, a real actual say. Uh, and, and that's, that to me is, is frankly the beauty of this whole thing is as a people, we finally have a shot to create our own destiny. Wow. Well, for folks that are watching Daniel, I mean, it is so inspiring, especially considering how much pressure there's been over the years and, and feeling like there's no hope. And to me, you bring this message of hope and you know, it's, I don't, I don't think you know this, but all the folks that are in this community, this crypto community um, are around the, the first initial token was called hex and they call themselves hexagons. And every time I hear (laughs) them talk about hexagons, I think about Texicans and I think Mm -hmm. about Texans and it's so cool because these folks are freedom loving people from across the world that I know, um, really would would wish you well and want to help you succeed. And so let's transition to what your current effort is, because you're a candidate for lieutenant governor in Texas. Tell me about that campaign. Tell me about the details of that, because I know there are folks in, in Texas who would love to hear from you on that on that topic. Yeah, look, I, I it had never been in, in the cards for me to uh, to run for political office. I'd, I'd done it twice before, uh, but obviously the time when I was 18 that I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> but I, I honestly, from that point forward, I never wanted to do it. I, I never had at political aspirations. Uh, I'll, I would always joke when people would say, well, all you, well, the only reason you want Texas independence because you want to be president. It's like, no, I, I want to go fishing. I want to be able to have a life that doesn't involve this. Um, it, but I ran in 2012 for state representative uh, as part of a slate of candidates um, uh, an organization had been working through a coalition to recruit candidates to challenge a bunch of the incumbents, and they approached the Texas Nationalist Movement. And I don't ever ask anyone in the organization to do something that I have not done or or, do, or, or am not doing. Right? Right. I, I believe in setting a true leadership example. So I threw my hat in, uh, ran, uh, lost, but you know found out a whole lot more about Texas politics than I was learning from the uh, advocacy side. And, uh, and then I was done, right. I'd done it, check it off the list. But at the very beginning of the year, um, during the, uh, during the legislative session, state representative Kyle Biederman filed our legislation, yes. um, the Texas independence referendum act. I, you know, I wrote that bill and, um, interestingly enough, 
as we were going around the state and speaking and promoting at all these events, people began to ask if I would run for Lieutenant governor. Wow. And, and, you know, I, I, first off, I thought it was a weirdly specific position to ask for, um, you know, and, and I know, and I know that there at the time there had already been rumblings that there would be some governor challengers to Abbott. So, you know, whatever, you know, but Lieutenant governor, but I, I couldn't figure, but it, it just kept happening over and over. And this culminated, um, you know, I guess probably, um, early in the fall, late summer, early fall, I got a, a letter. Uh, there was an open letter issued out by a whole group of political activists, grassroots organizations, just calling me out. I mean, they, they literally issued the open letter. They pulled me on a zoom, read it to me. And I said, okay, really, you, you, you're really calling me out publicly like this, you know? Uh, but the, the bottom line was after that, through a lot of consideration and prayer discussion, um, I, I made the decision. I said, okay, look, I'll, I'll honor your wishes and run. I'm not running because I ever wanted to be Lieutenant governor. I'm running because I want to be free and I want Texas yeah. to be independent. Uh, and so it, it has been a, a really, uh, I, I would say a, a, an interesting journey. I mean, we're the, the number one contender to the sitting Lieutenant governor which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, uh, I think it's a foregone conclusion that we will end up in a runoff election. Uh, and when we do, we're going to go out there and look, it, it's going to be about carrying the case for tech, not just for Texas, but for things that Texans are concerned about, yeah. such as securing the border and eliminating that onerous and immoral property tax and, uh, you know, securing our grid and our elections. So it, it is, a, you know, it's a, a big holistic campaign, not just focused on Texas, but I, I, I have to tell you, Matt, I, I can't go anywhere uh, on this campaign where people are not asking about and excited about Texas. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's just, it, it, look, it's featured, it's become featured in, in all of these campaigns. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a candidate forum last night among all of Abbott's challengers, uh, Greg Abbott, who's our governor. Uh, there was a forum last night and literally the question that they put to him was, uh, would you support a referendum of the people of Texas that asked, should the state of Texas reassert its status as an independent nation? And they all said, yes. Now two, two fun things about that. Number one is they all said, yes, they would support the referendum, which is not news because they've done it publicly before, okay. but here we are, you know, getting very close to voting. And they're not crawfishing. They're not, yeah. you know, they're not getting sheepish. That's number one. And then number two, the point of personal pride was that is the ballot language that I constructed. So they literally read off the, the ballot language that I wrote. So, wow. uh, you know, so while we have those governor candidates that support a Texas vote, uh, I am the only candidate running for lieutenant governor right now that supports the right of the people under Article 1, Section 2 to have that vote. Wow. Well, let me, uh, you know, you know, I'm a fundraiser, right? I've been in the fundraising world for a long time. And this, this is a special, a special interview to me. Um, you know, I think about my kids and I think about the future and I think about all of the courage that you've mustered over the years and all of the work that you've put in. And here you are putting your name, putting your, your life's work on the line. And to me, having you as our Lieutenant Governor would be a game changer in all of this because not only your intellect and experience and research and knowledge of Texas history, but your resolve. And so I, I'm going to appeal to the folks that are watching this video. There are folks across the country here. There are people across the world. And I know that um, there are some folks who have significant windfalls um, from crypto. And I know that there are folks that... Um, that care about this. And I, I would say that this is an opportunity um, to really make an investment in my opinion. Um, and Daniel, where would people go if they wanted to contribute to your campaign? Yeah, they can, uh, they could go visit the website at texansformiller.com. Texansformiller.com. Folks, I really want you to think in terms of that. And, and I want to make sure I specify this, you know, there's people from all across the world my understanding is you cannot accept money from from uh, or crypto dollars from out of the country. Is that right? Yeah, no, no foreign contributions. They okay. they frown on that. Okay, so no one. So if you know you can you can encourage them, send them a good note, an email, or comment, or put something on Twitter to encourage Daniel. But if you're if you're someone that's from the United States, um, I really encourage you to consider supporting Daniel. This is um, 
This is very important. It's not just important for Texas. It's important for standing up to authoritarianism. And it's really hope, in my opinion, that um, that real change can happen. It can happen in the right way. Daniel, I thank you so much for this amount of time that you've given me. To me, this has been, I, I mean, such a pleasure. Um, you know, I've heard you speak before, but I've never gotten an opportunity to just ask you a question. So um, I really appreciate your time and I'm excited about cheering on your success. Well, well, Matt, look, I appreciate it and let's go win. That's right. That's right. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you.